So this question will deal with random variables and combinations of random variables and investigate the properties of random variables and their relationships. Let's just start bit by bit. Let's start with part A. So we have a large population that contains just three distinct, so the random variable can just take three distinct values and that's negative eight, zero and four, with probabilities an eighth, five eighth and a quarter. So you can think of uh, that random variable, let's call it x, that takes values of negative eight, zero and four and the probabilities for these x's are one eighth, five eighth and a quarter. Of course they sum up to to one and what we want to find is the population mean and the variance. So the expected value of x is going to be the sum of the outcomes times the probabilities of these outcomes. So that's negative eight times one over eight plus zero times five eighth plus four times a quarter. And when you calculate that, that's pretty straightforward. That is a negative one plus zero. That is a plus one. So the expected value is zero. And we need the variance of x. There are two ways to calculate that. Perhaps the easiest to do that is the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x, because that first one we have already, this guy, that is x, the expected value of x squared. That guy is zero, we already have calculated that, so we just need this. So the expected value of x squared is gonna be minus eight squared times one over eight plus zero squared times five over eight plus four squared times one over four. So that all of that is this guy here and then minus the expected value of x squared that is minus zero squared. And if you do this calculation, what you get is 12. So that is the first part of the question. So now we take part for part B, a random sample of size two from this population. If the population is described by random variable X, which we discussed above, and the sample outcomes by random variables X1 and X2, what are the properties of X, X1 and X2 arising from the random sample? So X we sort of discussed before, so that is just X is distributed we don't know the distribution, it's a very distinct distribution, so I just call it a generic D, but it has an expected value, the expected value of X, we calculated to be zero, and the variance of X was 12. And if we draw X1 and X2 from this distribution, then each of them will have exactly the same. So the expected value of X1 is going to be the expected value of equal to the expected value of x2 is going to be equal to the expected value of x is going to be zero and the same with the variance all of them x1 x2 just adopt the properties of x and that means their variance is 12. so for part c We'll have to do a little bit of uh, legwork, so let's copy past part C here. Find the sampling distribution of W, X bar, Y and Z, and all of these are defined as some sort of combinations of X1 and X2. So we're drawing a sample size of two, so we're drawing X1 and X2, and then the outcomes of these determine the outcomes of W, X bar, Y and Z. So firstly, let's remind ourselves what the distribution of X was. 
distribution of x, we had three possible outcomes. We had negative 8, 0, and 4. And the probabilities for these were, let me just check that again, 1 eighth, 5 eighth, and um, a quarter. A quarter, which of course the same as two eighth. And that is an eight. Yeah, that's the original distribution. So basically what you now need to sort of figure out what are all the possible combinations since x isn't really a nice normal distribution so we will really have to go basic here. So what are all the possible x1, x2 combinations? Well, they could be, so I'm going to draw a long table here, they could be x1 could be negative 8 and x2 could be negative 8. Or x1 could be negative 8 and x2 could be 0, could be negative 8 and that could be 4. That is three possible combinations, all of them with x1 equal negative 8, but then x1 could also take a value of 0, x2 negative 8, 0, 0, 0, 4, or 4, negative 8, 4, 0, 4, 4. Right? These are all the possible combinations. And what are the probabilities for these? Well, negative 8, negative 8, negative 8. So let's just calculate that one. The probability, I do, do that here. Probability that x1 is negative 8 and x2 is negative 8. Right? So these two probabilities, we're drawing independent samples, so that's the same as the probability of x1 being uh, negative 8 times the probability of x1 being negative 8. Each of them is 1 over 8. So that is 1 over 64. So 1 over 64 is the probability here. We should, when we sum all of these probabilities up, which we will calculate, we will get the sum being equal to 1. So what about that next outcome? Here the probability is 1 over 8 times 5 over 8. So we get 5 64. Here we get 2 64, then 5 64, 25 64, this should be 10 64, they're all calculated according to the same principle as before, 2 64, 10 64, and 4 64. So these are all the possible outcomes. Now we have to figure out what do these new random variables take? What values do they take if we have these outcomes? So let's start with w. So w x1 plus x2, well, that would be negative 16. Right? Negative 8 plus negative 8 is negative 16 negative 8, negative 4, negative 8, 0, 4, negative 4, 4, and 8. Okay, so these are all the possible outcomes for W, and we have the probabilities to this. So this is P and W, the combination of P and W here is a probability distribution. You see some of the outcomes are the same, like we have negative 4 twice here, so we will collect them in a moment. So let's go to the next one, x bar. x bar, so that's the average or of the two, or it's w divided by two. So that will be negative eight, negative four, negative two, negative four, zero, two, negative two, two, and four. 
So that was straightforward. Now let's think about y. y is calculated as this term x1 minus x bar and x2 minus x bar. So perhaps instead of just calculating and then these terms again appear in z. So let's calculate to make our life easier first x1 minus x bar and then we calculate x2 minus x bar here. So x1 here is negative 8 minus x bar, that would be 0. And let's do x2 is also negative 8 minus x bar, which is minus 8, so that would also be 0. So then here we have minus 8 minus minus 4, that is minus 4. And 0 minus minus 4, that is 4. Okay. So we'll continue like this. Okay, so here we have minus 6 and 6. And you can actually see that we always have opposite signs here. Minus 4, minus 4, or 0 on both ends. So that would be minus 2 and 2. Here we have 6 and minus 6. 2 and minus 2 and 0 and 0. Now with that in the bank we can calculate y. y is a half of the squared value of each of these and then add it together. So that's 0 here. 0 squared, a half is 0, plus 0 squared, a half, 0. Okay, so that's 0. Then we have minus 4 squared is 16, half is 8 plus 4 squared is 16, half is 8, so it's 8 plus 8 is 16. So you can do that for all of the values, and you should be able to replicate all of these values here. Six, 4, and 0. And then what about z? That is basically just the sum of the squared values. So it should be double the value of y. So we have 0, 32, 72, 32, 0, 8, 72, 8, and 0. So this is the table which we now need, okay? But we want the distribution, so what we want, as you can see, let me just highlight here, if we're thinking of the um, of the W distribution, we have all these different outcomes, but they are not all different. For instance, we have minus 4 here and minus 4 here. And we have, uh, for instance, negative 8 here, negative 8 here. So if you now want to calculate or show the distribution for W, Let's do uh, let's do that here. Okay, for W, we want the outcomes, and we want the probabilities. So the outcomes here, the smallest one is negative sixteen. Then we have negative eight. We have negative four. Uh, we have zero and. 4 and 8. Okay, so these are all the possible outcomes. Then look at the probabilities. Negative 16 only appears once, and that has probability 1 over 64. Negative 8 appears twice, each with probability 5 over 64. So the probability here is 10 over 64, because we're adding probabilities uh, for distinct cases. So negative 4, again, has two probabilities, 2 over 64, 2 over 64, so it's 4 over 64. 0 appears only once, so that's 25 over 64. 4 appears once, twice, each with 10 over 64, so that's 20 
over 64 and 8 on your PS1s and that's 4 over 64 and if you add all of these together, these probabilities together, the sum, you of course get 1. So this is the sampling probability of W. Now you can do that for all other uh, random variables here, so let's do it for x bar. What are the outcomes? Minus smallest one is minus 8, minus 4, minus 2, 0, 2 and 4. And the probabilities here are 1 over 64, 10 over 64 for exactly the same reasoning. For instance, negative 2 appears twice each with probability 2 over 64, so altogether that is 4 over 64, 25, 64, 20 over 64, and 4 over 64. So you can already see that the, the probabilities here are exactly the same because W and x bar all are really based on x1 plus x2. The difference is just whether we have that factor a half in front of it or not. That's why these outcomes here, that one is a half of that one, but the probability is the same. And now you can see something similar will happen with uh, y and z, because y is really the same as a half of x1 minus x bar squared plus x2 minus x bar, I don't think I can go there, sorry. I need to do it here. So y is equal to a half of x1 minus x bar squared plus x2 minus x bar squared and that of course is just a half of z. So therefore when we think of the um, distribution of y and z we can actually write the table also like that. You could write individual tables again but we will get the same as with w and x bar. We get the same probability distribution just for slightly different outcomes. So the smallest outcome for y, because we're having squared values, is zero, but the same for z. The next smallest outcome for, uh, for y is four, and for z it is eight. And the next smallest outcome for y is, what do we have? Uh, zero, four, 16. Actually, I give myself a bit more space. So we had 4 and 8, then we have 16 and 32 for z, and 36 for y, and 72 for z. And now the probabilities for 0, 0, we have three outcomes here. And what are the probabilities here? 1 over 64, 25 over 64, and 4 over 64. Altogether, that is 30 over 64. 30 over 64. Then let's use the next color. 4 and 8. So these are these outcomes here. They appear twice. We have probabilities 10 and 10. So here we have 20 over 64. 20 over 64, then uh, 16 and 32, that's here and here, and that's with probabilities 5 and 5, so that's 10 over 64. Over 64, and the last one is 36 and 72, 36 and 72, 
and they have uh, probabilities 2 and 2 over 64, so that's 4 over 64, 4 over 64, and again, if you sum of that, if you sum that, you get 1. So these are the sampling probabilities of these four random variables, which are all some sort of combination of x1 and x2. So let's move on to the next part here. What relationship exists between the population mean in part A and the expected value of W and the expected value of X bar? So remember, the expected value of X, which was the same as the expected value of X1 and X2, was equal to zero. And now W, was defined as x1 plus, sorry, x2. So the expected value of w is going to be the expected value of x1 plus x2. The expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values. And both of these are zero. So the result is zero. And what about x bar? So x bar was a half of x1 plus x2. So x1 and x2 is of course just w, so that is a half of w. And therefore the expected value of x bar is equal to the expected value of a half of w. That factor we can bring outside of the expectation, that is a half times the expected value of w. The expected value of w we have just calculated to be zero, so that is a half times zero, that is zero. Okay, so they are all the same. So let's look at the last part of the question. What relationship exists between the population variance from part A and the expected value of y and z. So remember the variance of our original random variable was actually equal to 12. Now, what are y and z? Let's just remind ourselves of the uh, definitions. Um, y was a half of x1 minus x bar squared plus a half of x2 minus x bar squared and z was equal to x1 minus x bar squared plus x2 minus x bar squared. So that's the fit, yes. Okay, so and then of course we already saw before that y is really just a half of z. Uh, if you factor out that a half, you see is half our set. So we actually just start with set first. That looks a little bit easier. So we're asked what's the expected value of y and the expected value of z and how does that relate to the variance of x. So the expected value of z, so let's just do that as perhaps straightforward we do that. The expected value of z is equal to the expected value of our definition of set, so that x1 minus x bar squared plus x2 minus x bar squared. Now perhaps you can say Woof, x bar, what's that? Actually we know what x bar is. x bar is so it's x1 minus x bar is just defined as a half of x1 plus x2 and then we need to square that and then plus then we have x2 minus x bar which is a half of x1 plus x2 and then we need to square that. So and now you realize if you square that this just gets very 
messy and then we get cross terms of x1 and x2. Perhaps that isn't the best way to, to go about getting the expected value, but we know the actual distribution of set. We derived that in the previous uh, in a previous subpart, we know there are four possible outcomes, 0, 8, 32, and 72. So we're basically just now replicating what we found here. Okay. And the probabilities we found to that were 30 over 64. 20 over 64, 10 over 64, and 4 over 64. Then we can calculate, to calculate the expected value, what we need is, let's do that here, expected value of set is equal to the sum of the sets times the probability for these sets. So we need to calculate the product of set times the probability. Zero times whatever is zero. Eight times 20 over 64 is 160 over 64. 10 times 32 over 64 is 320 over 64. And four times 72 is 288 over 64. Now we need to sum all of these. If you sum all of these, what you get is 768 over 64, and that conveniently is 12. So that is equal to 12. And as you can see, that turns out to be exactly the same as the variance of x. So the expected value of that of set is the variance of x. What about y? Well, we know that y is just a half of a set, so the expected value of y is equal to a half of the expected value of set, so that means that is 6. And um, that's, of course, not the same as the variance of x. Now, why is that an interesting example here? Look at what we, what we have here. This is exactly how we would calculate a variance. This is exactly how we would calculate a population variance if we had two outcomes here, x1 and x2, with that x bar. We have two outcomes and so this yellow bit is really like we would calculate a population variance. Let me write this uh, equation here. We, Population variance is 1 over n times the sum of the xi's minus the x bar squared. Okay, in our case, n is 2, so that's what we have here. But what is now interesting to see here is that when you, when you do that here, the expected value of that is 6 is not actually the population variance of your population variable of this one. So this would not be what we call an unbiased estimator of, um, of the population variance. Whereas this one here said that seems to be because that is equal to the variance of x. And what is that here? What we're basically doing here is 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of xi minus x bar squared. Okay, so that one here is our sample estimate estimator for the variance. And why do we use that? You may have wondered before, why do we divide by n minus 1? So you can see here that is 1 over 2 minus 1. And here you can also enter that 1 over 2 minus 1, which is just 1. Well, we do that because when we use a sample estimator and apply to a sample, we get an unbiased estimate. So that was just a, a, a little aside from this problem.